Maris. Uitkrijg, oké, okay, ek gaan net nog een wee opzet. Goed, so, um, ek denk al die hemel net vir my help, die beste is, nee, mys moet nie te veel sê nie, raak mense, vir veel. So, I think what I'll do is, I will uh, do a short presentation, and then maybe we could go to questions, and then maybe get to the stuff that we would really like to talk about, and give everyone opportunity to, to participate. So, um, I'm going to start, and, and, and please, um, if there's a way to stop or to just ask a question you just you're welcome to interrupt me please do so don't don't feel that you need to wait to the end so yes so um i'm going to i spoke at the society many a few years ago i, I remember pam invited me to talk about our research at bloberg we are currently busy with what we're calling the TKBM, that's Tigerberg, Kuberg, Bloberg, and Mosselberg uh, archaeological uh, project so that is what I'm going to speak on today, but maybe first just a recap of, um, let me just go here, to uh, what I'm going to speak about today is the earliest farms granted in the Tigerberg, Kuberg, Bloberg and Mosselbach region of the Western Cape um, during the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Um, so that is a landscape archaeological study, so that is the theme that we are going to talk or that I'm going to present today. But first, I would just like to recap where I'm coming from and how I ended up in the Tigerberg uh, research project. So we started off, I think, 2003. Ian will probably help with that, but I joined, I think, 2014 uh, to 2018 for that four years. We um, did an uh, investigation in the Battle of Bloberg. So a lot of it has been written on that Battle of Bloberg, and that's what I spoke on, Pam, as I can remember the last time that I spoke to you, that was a presentation on that. So a lot has, has been written about this, but um, the actual site um, needed more study. So we, we went uh, in an archaeological project and tried to determine where the site is by two things. Um, so you can see where the, where the battle was fought. It was uh, at, at just uh, off the N7. If you've got the map, you can see on the map there, it was a large battle area. And my research project was very specifically focused on the field hospital. So you could see the battle lines there. It's a very old map of the battle lines. And the two structures you see there is the farmhouses of Justinus Kier. And these houses were transformed into a field hospital just after the battle. And we tried to determine the location of that. My colleague uh, tried to uh, determine the battle lines. Um, and we did a, a various studies on that. But after four years, we were able to produce a few theses, I think about five. And that was just to determine um, what happened with the, with, um, the Battle of Bloberg and where it was located and just giving information about that. So Ian van Oort that's joining now as well, he is, he is going to publish something very, very nice on the Battle of Bloberg, but that, that will come out later. He could maybe elaborate on that a uh, bit. So um, now the issue is when you finished your thesis, you finished and you have to, in a way, move on or get to something similar. So what I did after 2018, I did, I, I did my honors and my masters on the Battle of Bloberg, and I found something very interesting uh, on the site. So I'm just going to go to the site again, if you can see where it's situated. Um, I, I, yeah. The reason that I joined that was because of the Battle of Bloberg, but when researching this out, it was, an, it was an, um, not an outpost, it was an a, a outspan we realized that this outspan had a major role to play in history. So um, suddenly my focus moved from the Battle of Bloberg to this historical site. And going to this historical site, the next thing is uh, my attention shifted towards the region just around that. So from 2018 to 2020, I was busy doing some of my own research in preparation for the PhD at the VOC outpost at Fissus Hawk. I don't know if some of you know this farm. It's just off the N7. You can see it from the N7. 
and it was one of the VOC outposts. There were a few of these outposts. Uh, uh, the, the VOC had various uh, nodes that they used, and um, this was one of them. And it was qu quite a, a, an impressive uh, farm viv. So I started a, a study there, and what we tried to do there, you can just see the region. So there's Bloberg's Valley. And this road going through Bloberg's Valley connected to the Slachtersfeld, where a lot of meat contractors were, and they brought their cattle down on this route. But the important route shifted toward Fissers Hook as well. Fissers Hook going up to Malmesbury side. So these were the two routes going up north, uh, the main access routes going up north. Uh, there you can see Fissers Hook being in indicated. And um, what I did try doing at Fissers Hook, um, so, I, so I, I got very interested in these farms. And if you research one thing, it opens up another thing and another thing and another thing. And then, so this progresses that way. So what you can see here, it's a late um, 18th century uh, drawing of the outpost. And you can see it's rectangular. Um, and on the other side of the drawing or the photo, you see the current layout of the verf. So what I tried doing in this two years to try to uh, determine where this is on the, let me just get the laser pointer. So you see it there. I wanted to determine where is this on this now. So that's where my interest started trying to take an historic event or historic place and merging it on the current landscape to see how the landscape has changed, how the earth has changed, what has happened. And this has really prepared me for my studies now uh, for what I'm busy with. But I quickly want to just demonstrate what I'm doing here is what I would like to do with a lot of the farms in, in the Tigerberg region. So we tried, uh, the outpost was sold in 1791. And um, this is the earliest um, outline that we have of the outpost. But as you can see, it's difficult finding it on this uh, photograph because it's not rectangular on this. And um, just quickly, what we have here, we have four very nice entrance gates. You can drive this road. If you drive past, you can actually see these gates. They are so impressive. And the N7 runs just to this side. If you look back, you can actually see some of these entrance gates. So it's got four, one, two, three, four, there they are. This was the old post house and it had a few adjacent barns. So this is how it looked. This is the entrance walls. These photos were taken by Elliot in the early 20th century. So you can see these impressive gates. Now, um, there was a date that was inscribed on these, on these uh, pillars and that was 1768. And um, they've disappeared now. But what is very interesting, I, I'm going to write an article on this. These entrance gates tell a very interesting story about dominance, about the VOC, about the whole thing, the patriots, the, the, the farmers and the, the government of that time having, um, getting in a fix. And the, and the VOC building these, this is like a Kandla. They're, they're building these massive, massive entrance gates. I imagine this agitated many, many farmers um, because this is a show of, of power. So what we try to do is to try to determine the, the verf outline, these walls, try to date these walls. Here you can see the old outpost, uh, how it looked. Um, it went through many, many uh, development stages. This is the house now. It's unrecognizable, you can't see it. And interesting, can you see the date has been brought onto the gable? There you can see it. So people assumed <laughs> that's the date of the gable. And some uh, architects as well, um, historical architects, you know, dated some of these gables saying it's very old, but these are recent gables. And this date was brought, my, my research found these dates were brought on these gables they were never on the gables. There, there you can see, this is the, a new classic gable of the late 18th century. Before that, probably what we had the outpost was a very 
uh, a, a type of longhouse, a tripod bind, a barn. So it was a very, very simple structure, but as you can see, it developed, uh, it got a T as well, and it, uh, uh, the thatch roof was, was removed and it, 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 it was changed a lot. Now there's many, many um, stories about this house that, um, that I don't think it's true. It was said Willem Adrian van Estel had a lot of dance parties in this uh, part of the house, but this part of the house didn't exist in that time. So um, yes, so we're trying just to get some of the facts straight uh, for that. This is the third entrance gate. You can see it's quite different. And um, okay, so what people probably did is these gates, the, the two are, you can see they are different as well. This one is older, this one is the newer version. So probably what they tried doing is when some of the other entrance gates got, um, they changed that, they tried um, building something similar to that, but it's different, you can see there. And behind our pictures, you can't, you can't see it because it's behind the pictures, but behind the picture, you can see the fourth entrance gate. I can't see it because uh, our screen's filled there. And this is uh, the um, deep refere that is when it's uh, in flood, it's actually going into the verf. So we did some excavations. There you can see some of the excavations on the outline wall. There you can see the farmhouse. We did some test pit excavations to determine. So just on the right hand side, the entrance gate is on the right hand side. We did some test pit exca excavations. There you can see some of the test pits trying to get the stratigraphy. Uh, trying to date uh, some artifacts there. You can see this, this layer was disturbed. And, and from there on, we got uh, intact layers that we could date. And here is some of the dating. So we've got the wall there. And there you can see some of the ceramics going down in time. This is the ceramics we found. And so you can see at the top, you can see the refined industrial wares. And then it's going down to some of the other artifacts and going down to the foundations and finding nothing and it's being on a solid clay um, soil. Okay, so that's that's the research regarding um, first of all. So when I finished with that, I suddenly realized, well, there was a theory Gwen Fagan talked about it. She said, well, what happened is the first structures that were in, in the interior were these outposts. And what happened is around these outposts, the first farmers started settling. And her theory is, and it's a good theory, saying, well, what the farmers did, they tried to, um, they mimicked the, 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 the outposts. So these outposts served as a type of example, how then now to build your house or birth. And so th that really helps us Having Fissizok or a VOC outpost, this is one of the few left that has got these intact walls and, and verf. Um, I got very curious suddenly about these Tigerberg farms. Not just the Tigerberg farms, but the Tigerberg, Kuberg, Bloberg, and Mosselbach. So I would just like to speak five minutes about the uh, map that you are seeing there. This is a, such a nice map. You can zoom into it and actually it's, it's a map of the free old land grants from 1657 to 70, 1780. It's Gulka's research. Uh, all the free old land, all the farms, they mapped all the farms. They actually mapped the, the diagrams on the title deeds and they put the names there and they put the dates there. So if you get this map, you could zoom into it and you could in fine detail, I'm going to show it just now for you, you could see some of these farms. So what interests me is what you've got there is a few regions. These were the early, uh, so I'm just getting to the point how I'm going to research these Tigerberg, Kuberg, Blubberg, Mosselburg farms. So um, Menzel and uh, early travelers such as Menzel and Corby and Valentine, they, they all talked about various districts or regions within the early Cape Colony. And the regions, the first region was a region named the town that incorporated the peninsula, uh, uh, the Table Valley and the Lisbeck Valley as well. But it had, an, it had another area that was the Tigerberg, Kuberg, Bloberg and Mosselbank. So if, if 
They describe this region. They describe it by these names, Tigerberg, Kuberg, Loberg, Musselbank. So it's a, it's a historic, uh, it's not a modern name that was given to a, a region. It was uh, there from the start. The second region that they talked about was the Stellenbosch region, and that incorporated a few areas that incorporated the Modergat, the Botlarei, and the Hottentots Holland was all incorporated in the Stellenbosch. The Drakenstein actually incorporates the Wagenmarkers Valley as well. This was the uh, third district, um, and that was the uh, Wagenmarkers and the Ribe Castile and Drakenstein region. And then not on this map, you've got the Land von Wafren, that is up there, and that's the Tilburg 24 Rivers region, and the Piketbach and the Winningbach region. So um, what I was interested in, what I saw is uh, a lot has been written. What interests me is how did settlement develop from this region, from firstly the Table Valley region to the Lisbeck region, and from there, what happened there? And then I realized not a lot of research has taken time to, to describe the, the second frontier, how it developed. A lot of history describes how uh, the frontier expanded with the track bush and, 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 and to the interior, but I, I really couldn't find something that uh, tracing the roots and tracing the first farms, what happened when the first uh, expansion went into the Tigerberg region and into the Hottentots Holland region. So um, that was the first thing that was interesting to me. Um, a lot has been written about Hottentots Holland and Stellenbosch, but I realized that the region that was first scouted was, was the Tigerberg, Kuberg, Bloberg and Musselbank region. It's, it's 20 kilo, uh, kilometers out of Cape Town. So you can imagine if you stand in the castle, you are, at, you are looking on these uh, Tigerberg Mountains. That was the vista that they saw. And uh, trading with the cocoon, that was where they came from, from the north. Um, they were situated in this region. So um, I suddenly realized we'd, we don't have any information about this region, uh, farms. And the earliest expeditions in 17, Jan Wintervogel in 7, 1655 and 1657, uh, uh, Gabama, they all went to this region, but it's just disappeared in history. Uh, the second thing that became interesting, so a lot of effort in history has gone into Stellenbosch and Drakenstein, Wagenmarkers, but there's nothing here. And the second thing that was interesting is uh, from an architectural, architectural point of view, this region has been completely left out. It's, it's just non-existent. So if you, I've, I've now got very interested in architecture, uh, architecture and I started reading all these uh, people that contributed to that um, in, in the beginning, P.S. Uh, de Bosdari, uh, Van der Meulen, uh, Cook and Franson, Walton, Woodward, every, all these people. And you can remember, I remember in the 80s, uh, we started really getting interested in, in the, 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 the heritage of these houses. And that was primarily due to the gabled houses. And it seems that when you go into the history, the, the focus was always on the gabled houses. But as you probably know, the gabled houses is only a later development. Um, of a, a, a previous um, tradition that was there. And, and some of these gabled houses only developed from 1730, 1740, 1715 up to then. So um, a lot of effort has been on the gabled houses. I remember it as a child and they've been presented and restored and written about. And um, the Vosdari actually writes saying um, that the, the, the architecture of a previous uh, tradition um, is is not is not that um, how he he put it. I wrote it down. They not as important to 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 archaeology or to architecture. So it was ignored. And the Tigerberg, Kuberg, Blobeck, and Mosselbank, despite being very very old, none of these farms, one or two maybe, none of these farms are pre presented in these wonderful colorful books of the old farms of the Cape. Um, so you've got these 
pretty pictures of the gabled houses, but none of, of really of the tiger bird because not having these impressive gabled houses. So um, that was for, for me very interesting, trying to, to say, well, if it's been ignored, what can these houses, what can these farms, what can these verbs, how can this help to uh, enhance our understanding of, 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 of the early, of the late 17th, 18th century um, in regard to houses, in regard to people, um, because it brings a new set of data to this that hasn't been uh, discovered. Um, I, the the Bosdari says there's, n there's no uh, uh, farms to the north that is of significance. And, and that is just not true. These farms are of great significance. So uh, that's where my study got into. And there you can see the farms better. It's, you can go in... So we know there were about 23 farms in this region, Tigerberg, Kuburg, Bloberg, and Mosselbank. And there you could see the, on the title deeds, it, it, they have been drawn. Most of these farms date to the late 17th century, but that's when they were, the, the title deeds were issued. But what we now know, and what I would try to get to know is um, just before the title deeds were given, People lived on these farms. So what I'm trying now to do is trying to determine how did the frontier develop from Table Valley to Liesbeek to Hottentotsholland and to the Tigerberg. What was the stages? Where were the roads? How did it develop? Why did it develop? Because you can actually see these clusters. It's cluster of farms. They were clustered together. So um, that's what I'm trying to do. And there you can read it. I can't read the whole thing now because it is hidden by pictures. Um, but what we we'll try to see is how people uh, conceptualized, organized, and manipulated the environment. And the landscape perspective that I'm using in archaeology, we use archaeology, we use documentary sources, we... Um, on that, we, I'm going to show you, we put some drone images, some uh, remote sensing technology to try to determine how this region developed and um, what, were, what was the impact on ecological, cultural, economical, political aspects and how it can be um, assessed. Okay, I'm, I'm nearly going to finish now and then give you time to, to ask. So what we're going to, what I'm using is, uh, I'm using, these are title D. This is the title deed of Dimersdal, Hendrik uh, Sneven. And you can see the, um, the outline there that's been drawn of the, the diagram. So we're actually trying to merge some of these on the current landscape to see where exactly it is. We use historical maps. But most important, what I'm now using is uh, remote sensing. So I'm using this drone, the Phantom 4. We're doing some scanning. I've, the, uh, the whole morning I've been out on a farm in the Tigerberg um, and Valvergenucht, um, and we did some mapping there. And what we use on the left-hand side, I'm going to show you this program as well. It's stunning. It's QGIS. And we built various layers to see the landscape in a new perspective. So I'm going to show you that... Um, Firstly, I could maybe just show you some of the structures. This is some of the drone footage that we recorded. This is up yep the Jager. This is on the Dwerdekral farm. There's this very interesting structure. I mapped it um, for, for, this is just a little movie for it, but I mapped it that we can actually record it and do some recordings of the building material. The next one you can see is um, the one at Ode, Ode Vestov. There's a ruin there as well. Uh, I mapped that already as well. Um, it's very, it's a very, very nice example of various building phases. It's probably a wine cellar. There you could see this drone technology just brings in a new, whole new set of perspectives. And the other one um, that I recently did is, uh, let me go back. Okay, yeah. This is Westendal. At the back, you've got Clara Anna Fontaine. Um, 
there you can see the farmhouse and we found a very old structure just here that was demolished and we are doing the ceramic analysis of that. So I'm just, um, can I proceed? Do you want to ask any questions? Can I, can I quickly just show you something of the mapping that we're doing? And then I'm going to give a chance for questions quickly and then I could proceed. Um, so let's just quickly go to these farms. Maybe I thought, you know, I'm having difficulty now. What, what I'm trying to do is determine all these um, people that inhabit these farms. So it's, it's uh, in your field of research. I'm trying to, to get to their surnames and um, maybe you could give me some help in that. Um, with all the archives being closed, I'm trying to just find online services. Just to, but maybe some of these surnames are, are interesting or names are interesting to you. So just have a look at them. Uh, the Teigebergen, just have a look. These are all the farms and these were the surnames and the people that are indicated um, being on these farms. You can see the date on the right hand side. I'll be glad to share this Excel document with you as well. If you maybe have some um, good ideas how to, if you've got some information, I, I, I compiled the profile of each of these persons and of each of these farms, but my research has only started now. So I've got five years left. So that is the farms. What I would like to show you, what is very interesting is, uh, I want to show you QGIS and how we use, work with that. So what I did is I took the aerial photos of 1938, probably you wondering, how did your property look in 1938? And I can actually do it with the software. So what we do is I take all the aerial photos. That's the earliest aerial photos we've got of 1938, 1939. Then I merge it onto the current landscape and merging it, you could actually see through it and you can see your street address and you can see how your property looked in 1938. So that's the layering. and and. Um, let's just go out and you could see um, how I laid all these farms. So let's just, so you can switch on and switch off various things that you would like. And I say, I would like the satellite image of that. So I've got the satellite image, but I've got the aerial photo of 1938 for that. And I can add a lot of other aerial photos as well that I geo referenced on that. I can add the contours as well. Um, so you can see what we're trying to do is reconstruct. And I'm actually putting on that my drone footage, putting that on that, layering that. And so I could, you could really draw the progression of history that's happened on a piece of land um, for a long time. So let me just show you this. Um, Let's go to Maastricht and Bloemendal, just to show you. Some of you know Maastricht and Bloemendal. So have a good look at this. Let's go in, let's zoom in a bit more. A bit more out, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's just get there again. Okay, so... Some of you know uh, Maastricht and Bloemendal. This is a road going into Durbanville. So just see if I take off the satellite image. What you've got there is the 1938 map. There you have it. Some of you that know it very well, can you see the road coming up? You remember they called that Tiki Dry. That's the <laughs> Tiki Dry. And if you go to Maastricht, you can drive on this Tiki Dry. But just see how it changed. Now I'm merging the two. I'm putting the satellite and switching it off. Now there you can see it. There you can see the modern road going on. And there you can see the Tiki Dry going in. Okay. So this road, if you merge the two, you could see this road going from there, going out here, going straight here. And you see these trees. Uh, this ain't like a from Burma. So it's an avenue. And it's still there and the tar road is still there. So if you drive by and you look into that, you can see the tar road. So one farm went to another one. 
uh, to Blumendal. The old road, um, the old road uh, ran from farm to farm. So the O Wagenpad uh, passed here. But as you can see, it's so nice playing with this. You could uh, zoom in a lot and you can see these properties. It takes time to load. And this is not a high quality. If I now put my drone images on that, I could go to uh, two, three centimeters of measurement. And, um, and what we're doing is now creating 3D models of these premises. Um, so let me just show you how such a model looks. This is um, Mesh Lab. Let's just see if it's if it's let me just see there. It's just loading up. Okay, let me just see if I can let's just see if it's going to load now. Um, okay, so I'm not going to, I, I need to find the file, I'm not going to do it now, but what we do is we create 3D models. I can build a 3D model of these farm verbs and showing me um, every aspect of this, of this farm verb. And the idea is then to take each of these 23 farms and the farm verbs and analyze them in this way to see how this birth developed from, let's just put on the 1938 photo again there. From this, let me just, from this to that. Um, so you can see a lot of, um, from 1938, a lot of things disappearing and a lot of things appearing. There you can see it. And using 1938, going back to the site and walking and seeing archaeologically what we can find, and thereby combining documents, archaeology to recreate history. Okay, I talked a lot now. <laughs> uh, Alta, can you, if there is questions, maybe you can open up for if there's a, a, a questions that you would like to pose. Can I just question? make a point? Okay. Okay. Can I just make a point? Dr. Dansley has written a book, but in the back of the post, he said that the um, Blauberg in those areas was for the slagvee, and the people there began to hold the slagvee to hold. Yeah. Yeah, he had um, more Dan praat meer van die slachtersveld ook. Hulle het slagvee, die VOC het hulle vee daar gehou, um, maar, maar die slachtersveld het ontwikkel, um, het ontwikkel daarna. En dit was dat die, dat die onthou so die VOC uh, wou binnen hulle buitenpost heb. Uh, the VOC, what they wanted to do is to, to create nodes to, um, to service the, 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 the station that they had. And their main issue with that wasn't vegetables or corn or stuff in, in that sense, but it was meat. So these outposts were used as nodes to barter animals from the koi uh, koi, bring it there, but to keep their own animals as well. So, but what happened is these outposts were sold and they, uh, farmers were contracted to supply meat. Now, is it Slachtersfeld in the same in in area? Yeah. Nee, die slachtersveld begin wel. Hy begin, daar is een prachtige kaart wat ek nie, ek het om net nie nou hier nie. So the slachtersveld starts with, with Blauberg to the southern part and it goes up along the west coast. And there you've got a, a groen, um, groen, uh, almost a groen veld. Um, but it's that region going up into the west coast. So a number of farmers were contracted to supply meat there. Okay. But that changed as well. So if you take a 1901 map of Cape Town, you could see the Duer drift coming through. And that was an avenue passing on the N7 where people needed to bring their animals um, to be slaughtered in Cape Town. 
And that was in the beginning of the 20th century, you had this. But that didn't go up to the Slachterstelt. That developed towards Malmesbury. Okay. Okay. Marius, I've been, uh, if I may, I've been, I've been trying to find a cemetery on the farm Dordekral uh, for quite a while. I know in words it's described as being 500 yards to the east of the main house. A cemetery. Uh, a cemetery. Okay. Now that cemetery was demolished when the when the the, the housing development was was initiated there around 1980 1983. Yeah. So if I can find an aerial photograph, I yeah. have about four four possible candidates who might might have been buried in the uh, in the cemetery. Uh, yeah. But there's I one know. particular grave that that is described as 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 a very fancy one. Yeah. Uh, today there's no, there, there isn't any. You had a uh, in your in your display earlier. You had a, yeah. a aerial photograph. If you could possibly move that to the Dordekral farm. Yeah, I can. Uh, we can away have from where you were just now. Can you uh, see what we, I've got here? I, you know what that is? That is Dordekral. That is the farm. This is Van Riebeekshof Avenue. That's the farmhouse. Dordekral farmhouse. That's the farm must, building. This is Kendrick. That's the area of the cellar down here, about yeah, yeah, yeah. five o'clock. So I've got it. Gwen Fagan, Harvey Fagan. Uh, Gwen gave me these photos. So I've got a number of Gwen Fagan's photos and Harvey's photos of Duodekral. And that structure that you actually, that I showed you, that little structure, uh, I've got other photos showing that that was probably workers' houses. But what you can do, it's very, very easy. To, with the QGIS program to determine uh, exactly what you see. That's what's very nice about I never knew about the cemetery. So I've, I've never, that's quite nice knowing about that. So um, you could then go, let's just, I just want to show you. So let's just go to Duodekral. There is Duodekral. And I'm going to just switch it on here. Let me just see. Uh, uh, let me just see. I've got it here. I'm just seeing where it is. Welcome to Ruspum. Honor to. Honor to. Honor to. Help us from my Google satellite and I stand at Everstall. Do it a crawl. Not only Google satellite, not only blow three of Ah, as I. Okay, so come on, do it. Come on, do now. Open them, eh? Ons gaan nou dis in 1938 foto, en dan gaan ons in door de kral in. So, I wees nie by a date, let me. So, jy sê, I is waar? 500 meter? Want dit 500 meter oos. Oos. Dus ek nou kyk na die rechterkant toe. Dis die rechterkant. Daar so. Ja, as hy as hy noord, as hy noord sluit. Ja, ek kan een meter meter. That is what we can do. We can do a measurement. Now, the, the 1938 wasn't done very well. But what you can do is you can see the landscape here. Uh, and I can actually measure it. It weighs 500 meters. But what you then can do is you can... Um, let me just see. Okay, I'm just <laughs> yeah, you see. But now can you see of what as you the graph can create in 1938 photo, then can you see where what the is is gebouwd is. So the uh, the the vermoeden is that the stuk grond lay up. Ah, uh, it's not enough wood to build a house above the graph to build. Okay. But this is an interesting thing. Be a this is a nice point that you make. And this is an interesting thing. Can you for me um net the e-post, net your contact person here to see. Um, this Marius at Stellenberg, dot COO dot ZA. Stuur vir my jou besonderhede en ek sal graag wil gaan soek of ek kom kan kry. Daar iwers, so um, ja, stuur dit vir my asjeblief. Kan ek nie daarby aansluit oor die dode kraal bespreke? Ons het in die 70s, ek het in Belgen moet groot geword, maar baie na aan waar die woongebied dode kraal is. 
en ons het in die namara, daar waar dode kraal nou is, hier die skape gewaai, en daar was bingerde, yes. en ons het die skape gaan jaag, en as ons die skape opgevang het, het ons om probeer rui, en as die drijwe tyd was, het ons die drijwe daar loop skeel, en as ja. ons ons gevang het, het ons allemaal sies van die beste gekry. <laughs> ek gies nog net sy hande op. Patrick, sy hand was op vroeger. Um, is dit net gauw aan? Ons kan nie hoor nie. Kan jy hom net unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was just a question about the properties uh, on the Simon von Estelle map. I see yeah. the farms were not contiguous, so they didn't abut against yeah. one another. And yet they seem to be odd shapes. Was that dictated by uh, uh, contours? What I, I imagine uh, being determined by water. Water, and you can't... Um, Every farm that I'm visited has, has a fountain. So, okay. yeah, so, so water determined where habitation would be. Yeah. Without water, you can't live. Okay, it's, just, it's very interesting that uh, there's some very strange shapes there. Uh, yeah. I wonder why there were those odd shapes. Yes, so yes, no, you're, you are, you're correct. So um, in the beginning, what you just had is you had nodes. These weren't like farms, they were grazing rights. So people took their animals and grazed there and they started living there. And uh, what happened is there was a rule of how close people can, can be. And the reason mm -hmm. being is not to impose on the grazing of your neighbor, to give everyone enough area to, to be able yeah. to graze. Probably the, the angles has to do with the geography, has to do with yeah. valleys and rivers and whatever but normally it would be circular it would be a node water that's why all the farms are called flay uh, fontaine they are related to that and then they developed around that and the farms grew bigger and bigger bigger and imposed on each other but remember these births were 60 morgan they were very small they were not that big so yeah. you had you had the farm worth, and then you had adjacent grazing around this water source. Yeah. Thanks. More questions? I was just going to chip in here that Olaf Berg. I saw Olaf Berg's name passed there just now. Yeah. And um, in doing genealogy on my mother in law's side, she was a fond of pool. Yeah. One of the from the pools married an Olaf Berg way back when. But yeah. I think it is after that one that you had there. Yeah. Now, now yeah, because I would just like to end off with two very interesting figures, uh, Tranky Tienison, and um, I, would, I would like to, uh, but in the end, uh, two surnames. And if you have a few of these surnames that you are familiar with, please send me a mail. Um, and anything about this region, if you have issues, if it, just send me a mail, marius at stellenberg.co.za, and I would like to speak to you about anything that you, information that you have on these families. Uh, some other questions, Desiree? Yes. Hi, Marius. Um, it's Desiree from Joburg. Um, can you, oh, sorry, I haven't done video. Um, sorry. Uh, you're, that's fine. <laughs> ah, can you see oh, me yeah. now? Good, great. Um, Marius, I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, I came in a couple of minutes late, so pe uh, perhaps I missed something on your introduction. Um, I think this is a fantastic project, by the way. Um, a couple of years ago, well, many years ago, I came across a document that I think was privately written, and it's called the Oostronkelijke Plaas of Honey Wellington District. Um, and it was written by Jean Leroux and Willem Leroux. And the reason why I'm bringing it up, if you perhaps are not aware of it, I only ever got chapter two. Yeah. So I don't know how many other chapters there were. It is incredibly well researched about which families owned which farms um, over which years. Um, it was published um, on the internet through AgriSA and it's no longer there. 
Um, Alta could maybe do, uh, Alta, I believe it might be on, on the website, on the back end. Um, I can see, I'm not title? aware of that, uh, Desiree, but I know that the providers from us, Arfin is, and John used to work on that as well. Yeah. On this particular project? Yeah. On the farms in the area, yeah. Yeah, look, yeah, this is Wellington, but I'm wondering if maybe yeah. it doesn't cover some of the other areas, because I don't quite, because I've only got the second chapter, I don't quite understand yeah. what the purpose was of the document other than to establish what the farms were, who owned them, and how the families were interrelated. Yeah. Now, I mean, thank you very much. That helps researchers to see what their methodology was, you know, how did they go about it? So I, I haven't seen it. I haven't heard about it, but I'll certainly have a look into that. Well, you're very welcome. I can, I can finish you with a copy. Yes, too, if please. You, can you? Like. I would, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Super. Paul LaRue. Yeah. I just want to come in on Desiree's um, uh, comment there. The uh, work of John and uh, uh, Gabriel uh, Willem Leroux uh, was taken up in two, two different publications. The first one Alta mentioned is Bewaders van ons Erfenis, but the more detailed one is Ons Drakensteins Erfgrond, which deals in 16 uh, separate booklets with uh, the farms of the Drakenstein area. I think that is the, uh, the, the, uh, the publication that was taken up in, um, I don't know what the original uh, version that, that Desiree is referring to there. Um, uh, I, I don't know that one specifically, but um, yes, John and uh, Willem's publication was taken up in Drak Ons Drakenstein Erfgrond. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Paul. That that's very interesting. I I've, I haven't seen it, and and I mean the, these this research is very nice. You you just don't get a lot of this research now, so yeah, it's nice digging it up in the archives. Yeah. The audio textbook can be found by the yeah, Drakenstein Jimkring in the Peril. Let me just look. You can see a lot of people who can't even do filming. A Drakenstein Jimkring. You can it um, Google and open a website. Gaan. Um, and now can you leave start where? Yeah. Yeah, I will maybe not the last point there, so you must not leave the whole reeks to be bestelled via Drakens and Jemkring's website. There is a bit of a bug on the program, and as you plump volume sam to be bestelled, then then can the bestelling not out by the person who did it. Maar as jy belang stel, Marius, um, ek sal by jou kontak en um, ons gaan een plan maak vir navolgsing so lijn dus vir jou. Ja, baie dankie. Nee, ek wil um, enig iets wat, wat ek sal graag wil sien hoe dit aangepak het. Um, because in the academic research, the, the late 17th, early 18th century has not received the due attention. The attention has been on the 18th century and yet again on the gabled houses, on the, you know, the verse that has developed and very, very few research has gone into to, uh, archaeological as well, architectural as well. Is there other questions? You know, Anna Fra. Um, Marius, um, I can not take your um, photos and good innocence, Dixon, Maria. Want water Precies waar dit is. Ja, mens kan dit, ja, ek, ek, ek is nie so in die perro gedeelte in nie, maar onthou die perro gedeelte van die plaas en grens onder aan die perro gedeelte. Um, so dit, dit was ons nou, a, a, a harde kraalkie was ons nou die uitspanplek ook geweest, waar ons weet baie mense by gekom het. Maar, um, so ek is baie, die, die, die plaas wat ek nou kyk is, is, is in die laat 17, vroeg 18. Dit is baie ver, beteken van die latere ontwikkeling van die landskap in Peru. 
maar, maar ek kan onderstel, daar is baie ook goed dan. Baie dankie. Um, could I just, Alta, maybe just end off with, with two very interesting stories about, well, interesting stories about, uh, I'm only starting this, there's so much data to be collected. What you're seeing on the map now, uh, you can see on my PowerPoint, that is one of the drone, the footage allows us to do what you're seeing now. Uh, the one is a digital terrain model, and the one is a digital surface model as well. So you you can see it's just a lot of data about the gradient of the property. And this is Wuchelegen, the Wuchelegen property that you're seeing. And the old house was incorporated in this new building. But this photo is very important because the Google images only allow us a certain uh, view. But doing this with the, with the drone, I could actually go in to these dots. These are ground control points that I put down there. And it's uh, the, it's a HDH uh, bucket. It's the, the, the lid of a HD. And I can go in and to the whole lid. So you could just see we can, from this, I can do very accurate uh, measurements. But just uh, lastly, I would, there are two very interesting stories about some of these farms. And it has to do with, um, Yuan Furi has now written a very interesting thing on the, uh, the economy. Uh, how the economy developed and this region is showing some of promising results of, of what he's trying to say and the early cap has been depicted as a backwater society uh, being economically not viable what we're seeing and with my own research what we're seeing we're getting entrepreneurs here we're getting early early farmers and <laughs> the, the 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 surprise of the take tiger bird these, some of these farmers were women. They weren't men. The, the most successful farmers in Tigerberg were women. And um, they outlived the men and they outdid the men. And um, I'm hoping to write on their stories. One of them is a, a lady with the name Tranky Tienison. There you can see it, Tranky Tienison. She was uh, Tranky uh, Gansefanger. Um, so they're talking about on this map, this is the 16, 1691 map, 1691, so one of the earliest maps that we had. And her name has been indicated on a map. There's only two farms in the Tigerberg being indicated, Tranky di Burin and Elsie's Kral. And um, she's been indicated. But what's interesting about her, they all lived in the Lisbeek Valley. And her husband was... He was the first entry in the orphan chamber um, entries. So his entry MOOC81. That entry has gone lost, but he was the first entry. He died in 1673 because he went along with a few other farmers to an illegal bartering expedition in the 24 Rivers region. That is where the fall fly dump is. And they were murdered there. They were all murdered. And, um, and so she was left uh, alone. And, and Tranky then moved somewhere. She got a, a beer contract the year after that. Now, that is innovative farming. Uh, innovative thoughts. And in 1670, 76, she got a beer contract. And, and we can see then she purchased or got this property in the 1780s, 1680s. And she, this is Duarte Kral. And Tranky Tienison, she had two, um, she had two daughters, and these daughters became two very uh, well-known farmers as well, uh, Beatrice Verwey and Aleta Verwey, and and they owned some of the farms in the Tigerberg, Wuchelegen and Clara Anna Fontaine, and um, the other one was Wuchelbergsvallei, that is the area now. So that is Tranky Tienison, and there you can see. Um, the reference to her, um, okay, sorry, there's Dwila Kral, and, okay, the other one that I, do, I don't have it yet, but the other one is, um, it's very interesting, Adrian van Brakel. Now, Adrian van Brakel, he owned, and I can show the map, he owned, um, let me just see yeah, if I can find it. Uh, 
yeah, here it is. So here you've got the um, Gulka map of, let me can see if I can zoom this out. Can you see, you can actually zoom it in and out. Just have a look at this. This is amazing. So I could zoom in and I can find Adrian van Brakel, Wuchelegen, and okay, you, here you have Beatrix Verwey, and I just spoke about that. But um, so there's a lot of interesting uh, 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 families that are in, in this region. Um, the, the Adrian von Brakel story is very interesting because he had two daughters as well, Elizabeth and Maria. Both of them became, Adrian was the, um, he was a, a, the master carpenter and he became free, a free citizen in 1680. And then he had, he died and he's, uh, it was left to his daughters, Elizabeth and Maria. Maria married Jacobus Lowe. Uh, the progenitor of the Lowe family, and Maria, what's interesting, she, she married uh, Hans Jürgen Grimm from Stellenbosch, who owned Libertas, and after her death, she married Aramtas, and Aramtas attained Libertas through Elizabeth um, being married to Grimm. But I mean, so Aramtas came here as well at Wurgelegen, you can see um, that property being owned to by them. Also, that that is it. I, I, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, uh, yeah. Net een opmerking die Marius is je misschien te laat. Ik waardeer dat je zei dat Geisberg Dirk zijn verwij bij Saron van Moris, maar die die moord van die jachtgezelschap was in juni 1673. Ja. Ik weet daar zijn hele paar uh, geschiedschrijvers wat zonder uh, verwijzings uh, die afleiding gemaakt het en ik praat nou van redelijke zwaargewichten, zo so ik wil niet openlijk misschien die spreek niet, ja. maar ons, ons betwijfel die feit dat hij vermoord is, uh, die feit dat hij van die opgave van die die bevolkingsopgave afgelost is aan die begin van 1773. Ja. Hij was niet meer levendig ja. toen hij jachtgeschelschap Saron toe is. Ik so zal een redelijk oh, ja. interessante gesprek met over voeren <laughs> rondom, rondom die specifieke aanname. Hmm. Maar ik wil, hij so wordt bijna aangeduid, hij wordt hier geschiet kinderen als aangeduid als dat hij daar gesterf het. Maar waar zou je dan anders nou gesterf het? Is daar een al, ander alternatief? Hij heeft gesterf. Ja, maar niet nie in die middel van, juni, van, van, van 1673 niet. Ja. Want die, die censuslijst van 1673 is in februari maand afgehandeld. Maar ik het, ek het in, die, in, die, in, die, in die documentatie van die inventaris van die, het ek in die dagregister het ek dit gekry. Ek, ek, het, weer, ek wil het weer gaan kijken, want sy so, so, so die, dit is ingeteken in die dagregisters, en dis, maar kom ek net weer gaan kyk, wil jy, maar bel vir my, of contact met my, ek sal graag met jou wil praat, dit is interessant, baie interessant. Baie welkom, ja. ek stuur vir jou die informatie. Baie dankie. Alta, jy moet maar nou help ons, ek weet, of is ons klaar, hoe maak ons nou? As ons klaar, Simon? Nou, as ons niks meer vraag is nie, um, we just like to thank Marius, for a very interesting talk, and we would like um, um some of my forebart for you weer terug te, te nooi oor a jaar of wat, so you can share some more about your ongoing work. Yes, thanks. And yeah, thank you for everybody for attending. In Marius, Pam, in Fals, also what he and he folk on a vehicle, what are you a dry mark? If you are a donkey, say, just can't get off here. <laughs> oh, bye, donkey. Thank you very much. Yeah, and then just remember, if you've got any information on some of these regions or farms or families, please uh, drop me a, a message. It's Marius. I've got various mails, but this will work. Marius at Stellenberg.co.za. I would really appreciate any comments. Thank you very much. Bye, donkey, Marius. It was bye, bye. interesting. Donkey, what seems?